today is April the 2nd, 2019. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound. If necessary, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your provision for all of our needs. We thank you that you are behind the scenes always working on our behalf. We thank you for your word that is alive and powerful. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate on it this evening so that we can grow our inventory of biblical assets and knowledge so that we will be able to handle all the exigencies of this life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just took a few paragraphs, not many, off of something that I am going to give you this evening. You know, wickedness and evil never take a rest, do they? And we have an illustration of that by something that's called the Red Flag Bill that was passed in Colorado State Senate by one vote. Have y'all heard of that, any of you? Um, it, it passed March 13th, 2019, and it also, I believe, has passed the House, and it's going to be going to uh, the governor uh, for it to become law. Colorado has a Democratic governor in both the State House and Senate. State Senate have a majority of Democrats. Did I say Democrats? I didn't mean to. I meant to say... Uh, I'll just move on. Yeah, that's it. Both houses, the House, State House, Senate, and the Governor. Over half of the Colorado counties say they will not support the bill. But before I go any further than that, I ought to tell you a little bit about the bill. It's called the Red Flag uh, Bill. This is a quote that I, I, I don't remember where I have it, but it says... Uh, this legislation is being pushed by the New York City billionaire Michael Bloomberg and his anti-gun groups and affiliates. It's House Bill 1177. It would create avenues for individuals to petition the court to take away your civil liberties without due process. Further, HB 1177 would force you to prove that you are not a danger to yourself or others in order for you to recover your personal property. So what this is essentially saying is this bill will allow uh, people, like if you, someone in your family, someone in the um, law enforcement, it might be your roommate, uh, various people, can claim that you're not adequately stable to own a gun. And upon that charge, they would come in and uh, take your weapons. And moreover, when they come to when they come to get your weapons, they would go to a judge and say, uh, "We have a, uh, a charge that this person is not uh, capable, not not uh, really a safe safe uh, person to own a gun." And he would then give them not only a warrant to go and and uh, uh, confiscate the guns, our guns, but also uh, give them um, a warrant to search, search the house. So they don't have to wait. They go in there and you can be, uh, at any, any time of day or night, they can come and say, this is our warrant to search your house and we're going to confiscate your gun. And you, Why? Well, someone has made a charge that you're not sta uh, mentally stable or uh, you shouldn't own a gun. And then it would be somewhere around, it varies from state to state, somewhere around 7 to 14 days. Uh, then you could go and uh, try to argue the fact that 
uh, you are capable and uh, lawfully uh, adequate in order to uh, possess the guns that they took from you. Do you notice something that shouldn't be subtle to you whatsoever? That's right. You're there to prove your innocence. See? And that's why it's, it's such a hard thing. Uh, we're, we're becoming closer and closer to that. So many people uh, think that that's the way that we're supposed to operate. And then if, if you're not successful, then they'll hold that gun for 364 days, essentially a year. And at the end of that year, then you can go and petition and see if you can get it back then. But during that time, you are prohibited, prohibited from buying any uh, weapons. No, you can't buy any guns during that time as well. This is uh, completely bogus. They say, well, uh, this will give us time to study if they're uh, mentally stable or not. Well, they ha already have laws, and in Colorado itself, uh, they used it 40,000 times to take people, and they, I think it's, they, they take them in for a day and a half or whatever it is, to ascertain whether they're mentally stable or not. So this, this gun law has nothing to do with mental stability. What, Cindy? Yes, it's in 14 states. It's already in 14 states right now. And if you looked at a map, the states that are already um, utilizing this on the, uh, coast, the coast cities, coast states. Of course, Colorado is in the middle in Florida, but if you look at it, it's on both coasts. Of course, Colorado is kind of the middle, and it's not yet done, but it looks like it's going to be a done deal. And uh, so they they already confiscated thousands of them in these other states. And these other states have different the, the law is essentially the same. And the, and the biggest flaw in the in these uh, confiscations are uh, the fact that you cannot uh, you don't have a lawyer there. It's not that uh, you have anybody to represent you when when whoever is charging you that you're not really should own a gun. You have no representation there. They come and take it upon that. They make the decision. And then it's up to you, once they have taken it, uh, to prove your innocence. Which, th that is the death knell of freedom. That's the bedrock foundational uh, premise that freedom rests upon, is that you are innocent until proven guilty. But all the communist states operate on the idea that well, you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. And that's what uh, is so unsettling about this particular law. House Bill 191177, uh, it's also called the Extreme Risk Protection Order. That's another name for it, our red flag legislation, sponsored by Majority Leader Alec Garnett, Democrat Denver, and Representative Tom Sullivan, also a Democrat, would authorize the seizure of firearms from individuals without due process. The petition can be originated by a broad class of individuals to include roommates and anyone you've had an intimate relationship with. Well, I'm just thinking about ex-wives, ex-husbands. I'm sure that will fly really well. Uh, unchallenged statements made by a petitioner before a judge alleging that someone is a danger to themselves or others in an ex parte proceeding prior to any formal court hearing at which the respondent can be represented by counsel and present counter evidence would be sufficient for law enforcement to enter that person's home and confiscate their private property. Colorado's bill this year would allow judges to issue a gun seizure order and a search warrant at the same time. Garnett said that's something the state's law enforcement community wanted in the bill to prevent a violent confrontation with someone unwilling to hand over their guns. Then it says at that point, the two-step system, the two-step system is first go and get the gun, and then the other step is allow the person to try to prove their innocence. At that point, the two-step system has elevated the level of danger for everybody involved, including law enforcement. 
Also, if a person whose guns have been seized wants to ask the court to reconsider once a long protection order is issued, that means once they decided you can't get it back right away and they're going to hold it for at least a year, when someone would ask to, for the court to reconsider once long-term protection order is issued, they must show proof that they are no longer a significant risk. There it is right there. That's, that's the question. How do you? How do you prove yourself? Then it says, in 2018, the burden of proof for every hearing was on whomever was petitioning for the guns to be temporarily taken away. Garrett says that, too, was changed on the recommendation of law enforcement. Most, let's see. Uh, the measure uh, mandates that a lawyer be provided to the gun owner at the first hearing on whether a seizure order should be extended. Not whether they should take the gun. It's already taken. Then they are determining whether, the, whether it should be extended or not. Then you can have a lawyer after you've already been essentially uh, considered guilty by when they took it to begin with. The sponsors also want to provide the gun owner a longer period to be able to petition the court to re-examine their case as other states have done. There's a guy named Cole Wist. He's a congressman in Colorado. He says there are significant material differences in this bill than the ones that they had before or tried to get by. Notable are the longer time periods and the ill-advised shifting of the burden of proof onto persons seeking to restore their rights. I am opposed and urge the General Assembly to vote no. Now, Colorado has 64 counties, 24 of them already said we're not going to do it. That they're not going to support this and they're not going to, it's not going to happen in their counties and eight sheriffs have already stood up and said they will not uh, enact this law. They won't do it. And they said that the reason, they give the right reason too, they said the reason is because they took an oath to the Constitution and they will not break that oath for, uh, because of these high-minded uh, liberals that are in power that are overreaching. Yes? It will be, they're going to vote on it Friday. No. But that, they're, they're anticipating it to go through because the Democrats, you know, have the power in the state. But these counties, this is, they say there's, there's 20 counties already. They're getting close to half of the counties, 64. What would be 32 would be half. And they they say they think by the time Friday gets here, at least half the counties are going to uh, be sanctuary counties when it comes to this, that they will not do it. And you have judges, I mean, uh, the sheriffs, and God bless those sheriffs that stand up and say, uh, this, this is contrary to the First Amendment, and we took an oath to it, and we will not enforce this. We need a lot more like that. <laughs> a lot more. That's what we need in this country. Right. Sure. Okay, I don't want to linger there, but I just want to bring you up to speed on how evil continues to march on, but we know that they will be defeated by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the King of Righteousness. He is going to zap them with the sword of fire that comes out of his mouth at the second advent, also known as the baptism of fire. They will get their come up, and sooner or later. But in the meantime, we are to continue to grow in grace and knowledge, which we're going to do. If you'll take your Bibles and open to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 verse 15. We have been on this verse for a couple of times. Actually, we have completed, for the most part, verse 15. We're going to go on to verse 16 this evening. Let's read it again. It's not up there, is it? Okay. Where's my thing? 
Philippians 3, 15 and 16. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, meaning mature, spiritually mature, have this attitude. Attitude is extremely important. And if anything, if in, excuse me, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you, also to you. I want to just stop right there because I don't think I really hit this hard enough. If there are people that have a different attitude and that attitude is that of a spiritual believer and spiritually mature believers have an attitude of reaching out, pressing on, going for the gold. If there are those that don't have that attitude, it says God will reveal that also to you. That's God's job, not ours. We're in the business of controlling our own attitude, and that's hard enough, is it not? We don't have to try to control other people's attitude, nor do we judge them. God is going to take care of it. We're talking about believers here. We're talking about believers who had doctrine and maybe have veered off course. <coughs> Excuse me. Veered off course, or maybe thought that they just shift into neutral for a while and coast, which they, there is no neutral, they're going backwards. God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Now, we've gone through, I have to go through all this because we had a lot on verse 15. If anybody has a different attitude. A lot of believers have the wrong attitude. Okay, this is where we're beginning tonight. Well, let's just read the... No, we're in 124, aren't we? Okay. 124, okay. Let me keep scrolling here. Okay, well, remember, let's do this. This is where we ended. See... 124 down here lower. Um, and I think I can get rid of this now. Okay. Seven types of grace. You don't need a chart. You ought to know them by now. What are they? What's the first one? Common grace. What is common grace? It's common to every incident or, or, or opportunity to give the gospel to someone. God the Holy Spirit acts as a human spirit that they don't have so they can understand the spiritual phenomenon of the gospel. It's called common grace. First uh, Thessalonians 1, 3, 3 or 4, right in there is one verse. Also, uh, John 16, 15, I think. I'm just going by memory. Matthew 16, 16 are a few verses. The second one is temporal blessings. What are temporal blessings? Oh, wait, no. I, I got down on the... I'm just reading off the chart. Let me just get rid of that so I won't... None of us will get tempted on this. We're on the seven different kinds of grace. We have common grace. The next one is what? Efficacious grace. If people understood that, they wouldn't keep looking back at their moment of salvation wondering if they had enough grace or the right kind of grace, the quality and all that, because just a little blip of faith towards Jesus Christ, the object of our faith, and it's the Holy Spirit that makes that effective and makes it to where it's a done deal. We don't have to be concerned with that. The next one has to do with what? Logistical grace. When you think of logistics, you think of the military, beans and bullets. When MacArthur had taken over Japan, he wrote a letter to uh, the president, and he said, either se send us uh, food over here for these starving Japanese, or sing send us beans and bullets, because we're going to need them. And in that case, they did. And that was a magnanimous gesture with the enemy that was so uh, formidable, but it was the right thing to do. And then, uh, so, in other words, logistical grace is everything that we need in order to fulfill our mission on earth. God is take care of, takes care of that. But what if you're a believer that's not really interested in growing or anything? Do you still get logistical grace? Yes, it's grace. Logistical grace. 
What comes after that? Super grace, yeah. That's what we all should be shooting for. That's the extra measure of grace that God gives those who have set their priorities straight. They are living with the eternal in mind. They have a eternal sense of destiny, a personal eternal sense of destiny. And they are serious about their study and their relationship with the Lord. And that's an extra measure of grace that regular believers do not have. And it's grace. What's the next one? The what? Oh, ultra. Okay, I thought y'all were saying cultural. <laughs> ultra super grace. Few get that, but that's the, those that uh, have spent their life in suffering and dedication in a, a very significant way get even another measure of grace beyond super grace, ultra super grace. Of course, the Apostle Paul was in that, uh, in that part as well. Then we have what? Dying grace. What is dying grace? God gives us an extra measure when we are going to check out of this world. There's no fear. There's no apprehension. Some say it's the, well, let me put it this way. They don't say it because nobody's died and come back and said what it was. But it is, is uh, understood to be maybe the best time of your life is when you are about to go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ out of this veil of tears. And it's a wonderful thing. So that's dying grace. <laughs> the thing that makes dying so horrible is the fear, the lack of trust, and the ignorance. After that, what is next? Surpassing grace. What is that? That's the grace that we have that is not in the temporal realm. It is for all eternity. And we don't know a whole lot about that. We have some, uh, in, especially in Revelation, there are several rewards, or you could call them decorations and opportunities and so forth, mentioned, uh, like being able to uh, eat from the tree of life. And that says, okay, we get, out, we get to eat out of a tree. Big deal. Well, we don't know what all that goes along with that. So these are phenomenal blessings that we have. So you, those, those are the seven types of grace. We also looked at the six types of super grace. Now we've just taken one of the seven types of grace, super grace, and we've expanded a little bit. And these are the different categories that you can look at as far as super grace. First of all, we have spiritual blessings. That would be our whole spiritual assets. We have so much in the spiritual realm how we are blessed. And temporal blessings have to do with, um, the, I guess you could call it logistical grace blessings are somewhat in temporal blessings. They don't last forever, but they, they are for the here and now. And then we have number three, which is the blessings by association that Super grace believers can uh, have that influence on other people, plus God will bless others if, they, if just because they're in contact with you. The fourth one is historical impact that can go beyond the people you know into history. Undeserved suffering has to do with when you are suffering because of Christ and you are not bitter and you're not complaining and you see it as an honor to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ that is undeserved suffering and has great blessing associated with it. And then the last, dying grace blessings, which we just went over as another one of the types of grace. I went kind of fast on that. I'm going to go fast on this too because um, I'm not th trying to throw my anchor out here and, and explain these in an expansive way. I'm just noting them as we go through because we're talking about what waits us what, what is waiting for some of us on the other side. Generally speaking, rewards in heaven can be defined using these six categories. And I'm going to expand on these maybe later, but not now. First of all, there's riches. What do people think of most of the time when they think of riches? Money. And there's debate whether there's going to be money in heaven. Some type of an exchange. There's going to be cities. There's going to be all these other things, especially in the millennium. Is there going to be uh, some kind of uh, currency, some kind of exchange? We know there is going to be the millennium because it talks about the believers 
or the, the, the Israelites, the Jews, will be lending to other countries instead of borrowing. So that says something about that. The second one is recognition. We all want to be recognized in a good way. And those who are living the godly Christian life today have their priorities right. They're looking towards eternity, being faithful servants. Then they are going to be recognized as such. Number three are rights. <clears throat> we can really identify with rights even now because all of our rights come from God. They do not come from our government. The government's in the business of taking them away. And that's why our founders were so vigilant in making sure that the government had shackles on it, not us. But then we have regalia. That has to do with uh, ensigns, uh, emblems of royalty, a crown scepter. It can be fancy clothing and so forth. Royalty. We are already royalty. But as far as our royalty is now, you can't see it. I mean, we don't have a royal attire. In fact, you could be a pauper that's in sackcloth and be royalty. But in heaven, it's going to be different. Everything is, you know, the, the royalty will show. We are not yet the bride of Christ. That, that uh, marriage is going to take place in heaven. And then you're going to really see what royalty is. And the last is relationship, and that's what's so important in our lives, in the here and now, is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, none of us have exploited that anywhere close to where we could go. And part of the me message tonight and, and much of the Bible is extolling us and exhorting us to push that envelope, far, envelope further and further when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. Remember, that's what Paul said. He wanted to know the Lord Jesus Christ. He already knew him, but he wanted to know him in a more personal way. And we should have that same desire. Okay. Now we're shifting gears. This was kind of a review, quick review here. We all must learn to prioritize our lives by deciding what we are after. What are we after in our life? What do we really want? What our goal is in life is what is most important and then exclude the things that distract us from achieving that end. It's that simple. Most people have never done that. Most people just live life and it's like, do you remember the old machines where, uh, pinball machines, and you take the ball and hit it and it goes out there and it's bumping here and it goes over. You never know where it's going to go, but it's just bumping all over the place. That's the way most people live their lives. It's just, there's no, there's no strategy to it. There's no rhyme or reason. You're just helter-skelter here and there. And their life is a mess because they don't have any focus. They have not set their priorities in order. Those that have done that live a focused life which is in order. I believe all of us could have a little more order to our lives, couldn't we? Especially in this life, because you don't know what's... When you wake up in the morning, you have no idea what's going to happen. But if you have your priorities set, and you've been living a routine that is going in the direction of your priorities, then it's going to be a lot more orderly than if you don't have anything. Nothing in mind as far your direction of your life. Where is it going? You decide that. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul suffered in more ways than any of us could even imagine. What drove him on? What inspired him to keep going when at any point he could have taken the less, the easier road? At any time he had the, the option to do that. He knew he had eternal security, so why didn't he dial it back a bit and just coast into heaven? It was absolutely available for him. He could do that at any time. And when you start reading things that he suffered, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's beyond the pale when you start thinking of what he had to endure. And yet he never threw in the towel. I don't think he even it ever occurred to him to slow down, back off, or anything 
because his focus was like a laser on what is coming next. In eternity, as we will see. See, a lot of, a lot of believers, those that learn that they have eternal security, they think, oh man, this is great. I don't have to do anything anymore. When you understand grace and you understand you have eternal security, for some, that is weakness. Because they think, I'm going to be in heaven. That's really all that matters. You say, yeah, but your eternity in heaven is going to be anything what it should, what it could be. Well, I don't care. Heaven's a great place. That's good enough for me. They don't recognize the horrible insult that is to the Lord Jesus Christ as to what he provided, what he had to do and able to make the phenomenal rewards and blessings and decorations and crowns and all that available. No, no, I don't think it. I think I'll just be a bum. I don't even need shoes in heaven. I'll just walk the beaches. Everything will be fine. But you've insulted the Most High. And that means that you're going, your time on earth is going to be much less than it could be. And it could be nothing but misery and confusion and discord and discouragement and added divine discipline on top of that. Now does it still look rosy but that it doesn't matter to you? We'll get into that a little more in a minute. <laughs> Some believe the only legitimate motivation for faithfully executing the Christian way of life is gratitude for salvation or love for the Lord. You may think that way. Well, we'll see. Paul certainly had these, but he didn't mention them as the primary force leading him towards the faithful, towards, uh, forward to the faithfully complete his to faithfully complete his mission. He loved the Lord, no doubt about that. And he knew that his salvation was secure, and he had gratitude in that. But, but what I'm telling you, make sure you understand this. Neither one of those things are wrong. They're good. But it's not what he's saying is motivated him to keep pressing on, even under the worst of circumstances. We have to go by what the Bible says, not what we surmise is probably the truth. Some believe that feeling guilty or for fear of going to hell is what motivates believers to reach and maintain the status of spiritual maturity. Of course, these things do not apply to Paul, nor should they apply to us. Why? Fear and guilt are barriers, not motivators, in reaching our goal. There should be no fear in you. There should be no guilt in you. Whatever you've done in the past, once you have acknowledged it to God, He has removed it as far as the east is from the west. It's done. Forget about it. Move on. And so you should have no guilt. And as far as fear... Fear is a sin. Now, I've, I've argued with somebody before. They said, well, if you're going along a, 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 a foot and a half wild path, uh, a path, there's a sheer wall here and out on the, there's a cliff that goes 500 feet down right here and you're walking this deal. And you're saying that fear is a sin? I'm not talking about that kind of fear. Of course, it's not, I wouldn't call it fear. I would, I would say I'd have much concern. I would be paying attention every time I made a step. And I, I would, and I, I could even say I'd be afraid to fall. That's not the same as having fear that is unmitigated. A fear, let me put it this way. True heroes act courageously in the face of fear. The fear is there, but they overcome it, and we are expected to do the same. So fear should not motivate us to be good and faithful servants. But I will put this one proviso in there. Uh, we should be afraid of divine discipline. But that is a good kind of fear. Because uh, it's, it's, a, it's respecting God the way that he should be respected. <clears throat> so some think it's the 
The love of the Lord, if gratitude for salvation, other things, is fear or guilt or whatever. We know that wasn't it. So what is it that motivated Paul to press on no matter what? It was the prize, the reward that that lasts for all eternity. That's what it was in it. I want you to turn 1 Corinthians 9, 24 in your Bibles. I know I have it up here, but I think you need to maybe do a little underlining in your Bible as well. We have to go to the Word to find out what it was that motivated Paul to press on no matter what. No matter how many beatings, how many times he was floating like a cork out in the middle of the med. med uh, probably, you know, I don't think they wore life jackets then. He was probably dog paddling. At night, something starts, you know, chewing on the bottom of your toe. You, <laughs> I mean, all the things that he suffered and it did not deter him. He continued on. We have to go by what he says, not what we think, okay? Okay. First Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24. And here's what Paul is famous for saying so many times. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run, this is a present active imperative. Keep on running in such a way as to get the prize. This is a command. Unfortunately, most believers don't even know that they're in a race. They don't even know where the track is. They couldn't even find the city that the stadium is in. They don't know anything. And yet, Paul is urging every believer to run in such a way to get the prize. Verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. So when you're going for the prize, you have to do it according to the rules. That means you can't pay off anybody. You can't use drugs like some guy on a bicycle did for so long in France. You can't do it your own way. You have to do it God's way. And this race is not a sprint. It's a long endurance run. So in a long endurance run, let's say you're going, you're going to do a marathon run. And they blow a whistle, the starting whistle, or, or shoot the starting gun. And you, you, you take off running as fast as you can and you, you go 200 yards and you're out in front. Whoop de do, huh? All you're doing is you're burning up some energy you're going to need later. It doesn't impress anybody. This is a long endurance run. That's the way God has designed it. Everyone who competes in the games goes through, goes into strict training. That's a routine. Y'all have a routine. I know you do because I see your faces here when we have Bible class. I see you here when we have church. You are in a routine. That's what it takes. Then it says, they do it to get a crown that will not last. Remember we talked about the, the leaves, olive branches and so forth that make this crown. And after what, in a week, all the leaves fall off. There's nothing left to it. Now, it did have significance, I grant you that, but even the significance died off because it's all temporary. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. That last part right there is what grabbed, grabbed the Apostle Paul. He was not going to deter because he understood the importance, not of just rewards, but rewards that will last for all Eternity. The decisions we make, the priorities that we set, are going to determine our status for all eternity. Now, I'm talking about all believers, any believer here, or anybody that's listening as a believer, you're going to be in heaven. But if you have the idea, well, that's, that's good enough for me, then you just insulted the Lord Jesus Christ because he's done everything in order to provide the abundant life in eternity. We can live the abundant life on earth, but it's just a, it's nothing compared to the abundant life in heaven. That is why he was pressing on to the prize. He ran the race to win for the payoff. He knew that it would be worth it all in the end. He was 
single-minded and focused on the goal of winning the race. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, New Living Translation. Who wrote the book of Acts? No, Luke did. Luke. Luke says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So he talks in terms of starting, a, starting a, a job and finishing the job and being diligent in doing it in a way that would satisfy the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27. Now look what I did. Up here, this is 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. I gave you a verse, and now we're going back to the next two verses after we just what we just read. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 through 27. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. He knew where he was going. I box in a way as not beating the air. That's a defeat, defeated boxer. He's not making contact. But I discipline my body and make it my slave. Let's stop there for just one moment. How, is, how hard is it to discipline your body to the, to the point where it is your slave physically? How hard is that? Is that something you can do on a weekend? No. It's exceedingly hard to discipline your body to where it's a slave. That means when you go out to eat somewhere and you're, maybe it's a buffet and you're walking by all the desserts, like Luby's. Have you ever passed the desserts in Luby's? How great looking they are? And you just, no problem. My body's a slave. I can go look at these. I can smell them. I could get my nose within an inch of them. doesn't bother me because my body's a slave. Not many can do that, can they? It's hard. But this isn't talking about physically, is it? How much harder is it to do it in a way that we can keep a lid on our old sin nature and the sins that so easy beset us to keep a lid on that now, we, none of us are successful all the time. But when he says, I discipline my body and make it my slave, why would you do that? It's so hard to do. I don't know what your weakness is. I don't want to know. I can't hide mine. Everybody who's been around me for very long knows that I'm the king of impatience. But I can have victory over it, but I can't do it by gritting my teeth. This is my point. Paul says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. He did that. He was able to do it. And if he could do it, we can do it. But not by our own power. He did it by God's power. But what was the motivating force? Why would he even want to do that? Well, he tells us right here. So that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He's on track. As he lives, he's making decisions, he's keeping his priorities straight, he's taking the undeserved suffering and he's focused. He's doing all these things. But the reason he's doing it and disciplining his body to this degree is because he knows if he... And listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, maybe I might... Maybe I might backslide. Maybe I might say, well, I'm tired of all this suffering. I'm tired of it. I'm just, I'm just going to coast into heaven. I'm just ready for a break. He knew that even he would be disqualified. Disqualified from what? Disqualified from what? Heaven? Of course not. Disqualified from the prize. The prize of the upward call of Christ and what these eternal rewards are going to mean for all eternity. It's so, it's so, 
disconcerting that so many believers don't even know that there could be rewards in heaven. They've never been taught, or they've been taught that they'll believe it. But to, to get the understanding that this is what motivated Paul, because these are going to be for all eternity. And God is, is I'm not saying it's difficult for him, <laughs> because he's omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent and all these things. But in, from our perspective, it's hard for him to motivate for us by this because we have no reference point of how wonderful they're going to be. We have just little nip tips and little little bit here, a little bit there. But they're so phenomenal. Paul put it this way. He says, I can't believe that the little temporary mining, minor suffering that I went through is going to redound to such phenomenal, colossal rewards and decorations and blessings that last for all eternity. You see, when we get to heaven and we think, we get all of this for that little thing we went through? That's what he's trying to get across. So he could be disqualified. If Paul could be disqualified, who else can? We can. But that should concern us. But people are so busy trying to make their goal, making it to heaven, they, they just, they miss all of this. They're still in kindergarten. They're still dirty in their diapers. Because they're ignorant. Even the great apostle Paul could have fallen short of the prize if he had slacked off, lost his focus, and not endured till the end. There's a couple of things I want to get to here. Uh, before we end, and we have a little time. Philippians chapter 3, verse 16. I have two translations for you. The first one is New American Standard Version. Philippians 3, 16. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. The New King James Version says, Never... The less, to the degree that we have already maintained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Now they came from different manuscripts, that's why they're different. But essentially, they're saying the same thing. We have reached a certain status, we have reached a certain level of spiritual growth. And it's saying, let's continue to live by the routine that got us here. Don't be distracted from it. Don't lose heart. Don't be discouraged. Keep on doing what you did in order to get this to this place. And then you're going to be all right, essentially, what he's saying. The writer of Hebrews also encourages us to run the race to win, emphasizing the importance of enduring to the end. Now that man, that that and those who will be saved will endure to the end. That's in Matthew chapter twenty-four. Doesn't have anything to do with salvation, so just forget that. If you relate this to that, it is, that is totally um, experiential, and so is this. Hebrews twelve one through two. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, see, Hebrews chapter eleven is the hero's chapter. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. Now you have a sin, you have a sin, I have a sin. I have a sin that just, I, I'm weak in encountering it. And so it says what we need to do is to lay aside that sin, lay aside whatever encumbrance. You know, constantly this Satan is trying to throw things in front of us to encumber our, our progress. And we have to lay those aside. We can't let those get our focus. Our focus is still reaching for the prize of spiritual maturity. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Revelation 3.11 Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. How do you know? Maybe right now you might have crowns. You may have. You might be set up and have blessings you couldn't even imagine. But the Bible tells us here we have 
Hold fast what you have. Keep on thinking divine viewpoint. Keep on praying. Keep on rebounding. Keep on trusting the Lord. Keep on learning, going to Bible class. Every time you get a, a minute that you're in there and you're trying to get closer to the Lord and learn more so He can be using you more. Keep on doing that. Don't give up your confidence. Your confidence in the Lord. We'll get to that in just a minute. Here it is right here. Listen to this. Maintaining our confidence in God and believing that we are capable of winning the prize is of the utmost importance. That's this really important sentence there. First of all, we have to maintain our confidence in God that He is going to do what He says He's going to do and that He has the power, He has the ability to enable us to get there. We don't get there on our own power. We have confidence in Him, but we also have to have confidence that we are capable of winning the prize. That doesn't mean that it's a guarantee, but at least it's within our reach. We're capable of doing it. It doesn't matter where you are right now. Maybe you hadn't thought about this or hadn't been motivated. Now's another moment. Now's another day. You can start right now kicking it into gear, and, it, and it'll be within your reach. You have to believe that, or else you're not even going to try. Now I came to these next two paragraphs. I put some thought in here. I thought, maybe I shouldn't do that. I said, no, I'm going to say it because I've never heard this said before, but it's, I've thought about it before personally for me, and maybe it will, it will strike you as well. <clears throat> it's easy to become discouraged because there are so many in the race that can run faster than us, so we can lose heart thinking that there is no chance for us to win. Have you ever done that? I thought about that. It says, run the race. Listen, I haven't won many races. I can think of one race that I won, and it was in the second grade. And I can still remember it just as clear. Uh, we'd have recess, and the, and the teacher would end it each time. We'd all line up and run, and whoever got the fence first won. And I ran my little heart out and actually touched the fence first. I don't know how it happened. I guess all the fast ones were sick or something. But anyway... I can remember that the details that was at Cleveland Elementary School on 501 Barber Street. And I can see it in, in my mind winning that race. When I was in high school, I, run, I was I was in track, but I didn't run. I I ran. I mean, I I put the shot put and threw the discus. But I was very fast. Why wasn't I on the track team? I was very fast. For the first 20 yards. You see, I'm long-waisted, which means I have short legs. And so, when it came off the line, I would, you know, you'd have short legs and move real quick. And I could take them all off the line for the first 20, 20 yards. I mean, I was quick. But after 20 yards, those old longer legs started stretching out. And I started to see their tail lights, see. And they just went off and left me. It was okay. I played on the line, and my quickness was good because I, you don't have long ways to go on the line. It's just quick. But I have thought about it. I said, man, there's so many people, that, so many believers out there that how am I going to beat them? Listen to this very closely. I, I shut this off because I didn't want you all to read ahead, but now I want you to read this. Here we are right here. Um, where's my deal? Right here. But we are not competing against other believers. We are competing against ourself. Our old self. The word, the flesh, and the devil are our real competitors. They try to tempt us, distract us, and discourage us so that we won't, will not win the prize. That is so comforting to me. God doesn't want you to compete with other believers. It's not like we're all in a race and one is going to win the prize. When I think of that, I think, well, I might as well just not even get in starting blocks because i got these little short legs. And this is endurance run anyway. How am I going to last that long? But when you understand the race is against yourself, your old self, and when you are battling that consistently, 
You're not going to win every time. There's going to be setbacks. But when you continue to do that, you win the race that was against yourself with God's help. I don't know about you, but that really helped me. Because I got discouraged. I thought, well, <laughs> forget me winning a race. I, I, my whole life, I only remember one and one in second grade, and I can still remember it. How many win a race with millions of believers? Here we are right here. Do you know the spiritual status you have attained? Are you a baby believer, an adolescent believer, or a mature believer? That's a question you can chew on until next time because this goes into uh, what is following next. I mean, I don't know if you ever considered where you are spiritually, whether you're a baby believer, adolescent, or mature. Now, all of us like like a baby believer from time to time. Even mature believers slip sometimes. Or an adolescent or a mature. And I'm going to give you eight points on the characteristics of a mature believer. So you can take your modus operandi, your routine, your lifestyle, and compare it to that. And maybe that might help you to see where you are on the spiritual scale as to what status you may be in. And that might be helpful. Because I think we ought to think about this sometimes. Because if you are still in your diapers spiritually and you've been saved for 20 years, the clock is ticking. I don't know how much time we have left but if you're going to kick it into gear, now would be a good time. And we can. That's the great thing. God has given us this grace. We are living on grace right now. This country is living on grace. But the clock is going to run out one of these days. For the country and for us as well. So I would say, these things are worth meditating on, thinking about. What do I need to do in order to focus and anticipate these great rewards and decorations and blessings that are going to last for all eternity. I can decide right now and make decisions and set priorities that are going to determine what I'm going to be for all eternity. Do you understand how important that is? How many people don't know that? Most of them don't know it. But most of them don't even know that those rewards and decorations are even a potential. They're still struggling with, well, I hope I make it into heaven. How pathetic is that? We're out of time. We'll start there next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, you are so gracious and so merciful. Your plan is beyond us. Uh, 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 with our little brains, all we can do is get a little glimpse here or there. But we still have time to focus to set our priorities straight, to make decisions that will lead down to these phenomenal blessings and rewards and opportunities that will last for all eternity. We pray that you will impress upon us, first of all, that we can do it because you're going to give us the grace to do it, but that we will have the will to do it, that we can see that shining city on a hill way off in the distance. This isn't salvation. This is beyond salvation because, again, of your phenomenal grace. Help us to think about this. We need to do it now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.